one of the finest ways that I can prove my love for the Lord and his work has to do with the way I give. And according to the Apostle Paul, you and I should be at all times ready to give. I invite your attention to a reading of 2 Corinthians 9, 1 through 7. 2 Corinthians 9, 1 through 7. One of the most famous chapters in all of the Bible on giving. Paul reminding these brethren that one year earlier, he had asked them to contribute to the necessity of the saints in Jerusalem. For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous, superfluous for me to write to you. I shouldn't have to tell you this, Paul says. He's very tactful here because he's not very pleased with the fact that they should have had this ready. For I know the forwardness of your mind for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia. I've been telling everybody how you're ready to give, Paul says. I've announced it to all these brethren about your readiness. And I'm telling them you were ready a year ago. He knows they haven't gotten it together yet. But it's interesting how he approaches them. And your zeal hath provoked very many. Everybody else thinking about the way you get, gave is not willing now to give. Well... Interesting how he uses that. Yet have I sent the brothers. I've been boasting about your giving, but I've ha I have to send the brothers to get it. Lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, ye may be ready. Why should they be ready? Because they're Christians. And Christians, by their very nature and by definition of what they are, are givers. Lest haply if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in the same confident boasting. Paul says, have I boasted about you and you really aren't ready? I was asked to come to a congregation in another state to preach to them in a gospel meeting. And one of the sermons I had prepared was on giving. I called the local chamber of commerce to find out what the average family income was. This congregation had 30 or 44 families in it. And so I figured at 10% what their contribution should be weekly. They had 114 members and their contribution was $300 a week. One of the leaders of that congregation was the owner of the local Walmart franchise, a multimillionaire, $300 a week. When I began to preach on it, I noticed how uneasy he was. And when I got done with the sermon, he called me aside and said, this meeting is over. We're going to ask you to leave. We don't want to hear a sermon on giving. Evidently not. But I thought about this passage. They were not ready to give, unfortunately. But that proves the sincerity of our love. Paul said to these Corinthian brethren, are you really sincere? You're supposed to have gotten this together a year ago as I give an order to the churches of Galatia even so do ye on the first day of every week let each one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him that there be no gatherings when I come I don't want to have to come there and go around and get it all together you should be ready you should be ready to give it is a trait of a Christian Paul used another con or other congregations trying to motivate these Corinthian brethren to be ready to give. Look over there at 2 Corinthians 8. He said, Moreover, brothers, we do you to wit. We want you to know. Now notice what Paul calls giving. I don't know what you call it. Notice what Paul calls it. The grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, they wanted to give. They were ready to give. And their deep poverty abounded under the riches 
of their liberality. These are poor folks financially, but they were not poor spiritually. These are folks who are liberal in their giving. They wanted to give. They asked Paul to let them give. For to their authority I bear record, yea, and beyond their th the power they were willing of themselves. They were ready. They were not holding back here. They didn't squeeze the nickel so the buffalo was ridden by the Indian. They were ready to give, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. Now watch what he calls it. The grace of God, now, not, now watch what he calls it. And take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. How did they arrive at this position to be ready to give? They were first willing of themselves. They gave themselves to the Lord. Verse 5. What an interesting motivation to the Corinthian brethren. Look at these Macedonian brethren. They don't have a lot of money. Yet they begged us. Let us help with the poor saints down there in Jerusalem. Let us help with this special effort. We want to give. What's wrong with you Corinthians? You should have been ready a year ago. Stewardship, when it's motivated, recognizes something. It recognizes that by virtue of creation and the sovereign rule of God, he owns everything. It doesn't belong to me anyway. I don't have a wallet. It's his. I don't have a car. It's his. I don't have a house. It's his. And that is why God seeks from us this attitude of giving. He has the right to ask me that. Look at what Malachi said in the long ago. Notice this question. It's an amazingly interesting question. Will a man rob God? Now, whom are you asking that? I'm asking you Jews, you covenant people, you children of God. What an interesting question for the children of the sovereign God who created them, who developed their nation, who made them his people. Will a man rob God? Yes. Yet you have robbed me. But you say, God, how did we rob you? In your tithes, now notice, and offerings. Not just in what you gave on the Sabbath, but what you did with the rest of it for the rest of the week. In your tithes and offerings. You see, children, it belongs to me, not you. It isn't your money. And you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me this whole nation. But Lord, we came every Sabbath. We gave, oh, you didn't give enough. Now you bring all of that into the storehouse and prove me. What? Test me. How much cash do you have in your wallet right now and your purse? You know what he's saying to us, brothers and sisters? He's saying take it all out and put it in the plate and see what happens. Test me. See if I don't give you a blessing. I said that one time down in South Haven. One fellow I knew carried $20,000 around in his wallet all the time. I noticed the contribution didn't go up $20,000. <laughs> he was unwilling to test it. To prove what the Lord meant here. Open your New Testament to Luke 6, 38. Luke 6, 38. Now get to these other verses in a moment. Good measure. Watch his promise. Pressed down. Shaken together. Running over. Shall men give into your bosom. For with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. What's the promise, Lord? That when I do it right, there's a tremendous blessing in it. Test it. See if it works. Pardon me for the personal illustration. It's the only one I know on this subject. 
Back in the 1960s, a missionary came to Fort Wayne, Indiana from South Korea. He was trying to raise, at that time, $1,200 to build a building, if you can imagine building it for that cost now, in South Korea. He said he didn't want to have to go around to 1,200 brothers and get a dollar from each. Could he find four people who would give $300? My wife spoke up and said, we'll give it. I said, no, we don't have it. So we went to the bank and borrowed it. I was very distraught about that. I knew I now had to pay back $300. I worked for Dana Corporation then, and interestingly enough, had a retirement program that I, into which I was putting money each month, not very much. We got a letter a couple of weeks after that incident with that missionary from South Korea that said the company was disbanding the voluntary program and was going to do it all themselves. Our retirement would be paid for by the company. If we had any money in that particular account, come and get it out. You want to know how much I had in there? Oh, you're going to say 300. Oh, no. You see, good measure. Pressed down. Shaken together. Running over. $349. <laughs> That's not funny. That has worked for me and Dorothy all of our Christian lives. That's how it goes. You keep it in your wallet and you can't get blessed. You see, you have to test that. Does it work? I've had people tell me, well, if I give, then I won't have anything. Oh, it's ba that's backwards for a Christian. That's absolutely backwards. Look at 2 Corinthians 8, 7. Therefore, as you abound in everything, faith, what you believe, utterance, what you say you believe, what you say you know, and what you say you're doing, abound in this grace also. What's this grace? Giving. Giving. Since a steward is one who manages the property of another, my involvement in giving is management. I have to manage my money so that God is first in my giving, in my budget. He's number one. He doesn't want the leftovers. He insists on the first fruits. He says, Keith, you give me from the gross, not the net. You have to manage it that way. You have to administer it, and you have to invest it in heaven. I'll never forget the sermon that Brother Whitaker preached from Matthew 6, 19 through 21 on investing in heaven. That's what it's all about. Look at Luke 16 with me, please. Luke 16. Here's a parable that is misunderstood, misapplied, mistaught. In fact, it's the most misunderstood parable of all of the Lord's parables. And the majority of his parables were on what subject? Giving. He knows about our wallets. He knows about our hearts. And he reminds us here uh, to plan for the future. Watch what he says. He said unto, also unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man. He represents God in this parable. Who had a steward, represents us. And the same was accused unto him, the rich man, that he, the steward, had wasted the rich man's goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. This guy cheated his boss. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? I'm fired. My Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed. I don't like manual labor and I don't want to go out and beg. He starts planning for his future and he will be commended for that. Not for stealing. Not for cheating. But for planning for his future. I am resolved what to do. That when I am put out of the stewardship, they, they who, he's going to tell us in a moment, may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto thy Lord? Watch him, he's a cheater. 
He's going to tell this fellow, you go ahead and cheat and I'll mark it down in the books. And he said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, take thy bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Just pay half as much and I'll fix the books. He's not commended for that. What's he doing? Planning for his future. That's the point of the parable. Planning for our future. He said unto another, how much owest thou? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said unto him, take thy bill and write 80. He's cheating, but he's planning for his future. And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. Why? For the sons of this world, he represented by the steward there, a son of this world, are wiser in their generation than the children of light. Sometimes Christians don't plan for their future. If you have any money in your wallet this morning, I recommend you memorize the serial numbers because you're going to see them again. This is the mammon of unrighteousness. Notice the next verse. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. This stuff. For that when you fail, when you die, it may receive you. Plan for your future, folks. God's going to take into account how, what we did with this. How we used it. How we managed it. Where we invested it. How we gave it. We need to make a friend out of it. Use it wisely. Why? Look at verse 10. He that is faithful in that which is least, that, that's nothing. Money is just a tool. But if I'm not faithful in it, he's not going to give me that blessing. He that is unjust in the least is also unjust in much. Here's where it begins, folks, with our wallets. Christianity begins there. It might not be a bad idea when we baptize someone to baptize his or his wallet and her purse. Because Christianity begins right there with how we give. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 8. 2 Corinthians 8. Verse 8. Paul says to the Corinthian brethren, this I'm teaching you is not a commandment per se, but I'm telling you what others did. And I want to prove the sincerity of your love. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he was in heaven. The paragon the second person, God, gave it all up to be humiliated. He was rich. He was there. He made a decision to leave. Why? For us. When did he make that decision? Before he created us. Before the foundation of the world. The lamb was slain. Though he was rich. Yet for your sakes, he became poor. How much did he give? Everything. That ye through his poverty might be rich. So here's my advice, Paul says, watch. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago, do it. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it. You said you would, now do it. Giving has to be planned. They planned to do it. The problem was they hadn't done it yet, but they planned it. It, they had a plan to give to God first. They had purposed to do it first. They had promised to do it. Look at verse 16. 
But thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care in the heart of Titus for you, to, for you. For indeed, he accepted the exhortation, but he wanted to come and see you anyway. Verse 18. We sent with him a brother, and you all know him. Verse 19. We sent some others. You made a promise. You made a plan. You had purposed. We're sending these brothers to get the collection. Paul said, I so expect you to keep your word that I'm sending the collectors to get it. I learned from this text that my giving has to be planned. It's not a last minute thing. It has to be purposed. How much did I make? What's 10% of it? Why did you say 10%, Keith? That's about the least for a Christian. What's 10% of it? And I promised to do this when I became a Christian. God expects that His people will never appear before Him empty. Exodus 23, 15. We all remember this account of the wo woman who had two mites. The Lord watching that giving as He always does. Watched her put in all she had and told his disciples she gave more than anybody. Well, Lord, those other people put in this much. Yes, but she gave more. I wonder if she remembered good measure, pressed down, shaken together. You know, when you fill something with grain or something, you shake it, you can get more in it. That's the point. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. And running over, shall men give. This extra benefit comes from people. That's how it works. That's what he's trying to teach us. And he watched that woman put in the two mites. And he said she gave more than anybody. She gave everything she had. Mark 12, 41 and 43. Cheerful giving. Destroy something called covetousness. Look at Matthew 25 with me, please. Matthew 25, beginning in verse 14. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man traveling into a far country, who called unto them, unto him, his own servants, and delivered unto them his goods. Whatever you gave those servants belonged to the man traveling into the far country. That represent, represents the Lord going back to heaven. And he said to his servants, come here a minute. I've got something for you. It belongs to me, but I'm giving it to you while I'm gone. I'm going to give you five pieces of silver. And I'm going to give you two pieces of silver. And I'm going to give you one piece of silver called talents here in the King James. Pieces of money. You reckon how he discovered how he should do that? How did he know to give that fellow five and that fellow two and that fellow one? Watch what your text says. Every man according to his several ability. God never expects Keith to give what he doesn't have. He never expects anyone to do what he can't do. But he knows that if I have it, he gave it to me for a reason. He knows that I will take care of it. Because God never gives me anything I can't do. And God said, give, and it shall be given you. Good measure. Pressed down. Are you getting this verse yet? Shaken together. Running over. Shall men give into your bosom. What a challenge. He decided you can handle that, and you can handle that, and you can handle that. Do you remember what one of those fellows did with the money that was given him? He buried it in the backyard. Why? Why did he do that? He had the idea that God was just too hard. God was too hard, and he would never receive a blessing, so he was so fearful to use it that he lost it. God never gives me something that I cannot do. I like that. He expects it. And every Christian
can give as he has been prospered. Or God would not have told us that. 1 Corinthians 16, 2. <coughs> I wrote here that surely no one believes that money in the collection plate satisfied all of God's requirements for a Christian. How can I explain this to us? This act of putting the money from my hand into the collection plate is not the act of giving. It's how we collect it. The act of giving takes place up here because I purposed it. I planned it. I promised it. I already knew before I ever came before him in worship, what I was bringing. And I knew that what I was bringing was only part of it. Because my Bible still teaches me, let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good. Why? So he can put it in a mini storage bin? So he can have more stuff to sell at the yard sale? Or... Should we read the end of the verse which says that he might have to give to him that needeth? Ephesians 4, 28. God knows my wallet. He knows my checking account. And why do I give? Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies, a living offering, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your logical service. Romans 12, 1. Christians give because that's what they do. They never hold back. If they have to borrow it, they give it. If they have to sell their land, they give it. Acts chapter 4. If they have to, no, because they want to. You know where this starts? It starts with giving me to God. Go back there to Romans 12, 1 a moment. I beg you. He's on his apostolic knees. I beg you. By the mercies of God. Was there a time in your life when you said to God, Everything I have belongs to thee. Everything I ever will be belongs to thee. That's what Romans 12, 1 is all about. That includes my money, my time, includes me. That may be the reason it's so hard for people to understand why they have to be immersed in water as the point at which God takes away their sins. Because that immersion involves the whole of a person. And maybe he's just not willing to give that. But God calls on him to do that. To make a decision that's called repentance. To stop living a life of sin and to start living for God completely. It's simple what he requires when you hear that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again the third day. He requires that you confess that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Not a hard thing to do. You can do that. He requires that you be immersed in that water. That's the whole of you. As you come up out of that watery grave, he takes away your sins. And he will not do it until you go through that process. All your past sins will be removed at that moment and only at that moment. And all of your guilt from the past will be removed at that moment and only at that moment. But once you come up out of that watery grave, now you're a giver. Now everything you have belongs to him. You're his child. You're part of his family. You're a member of the body of Christ. You're in the church of Christ. You're a giver. And brothers and sisters... It is a great joy to be a giver, not a taker. 
It's where the blessing is. And God said, prove me. If I won't pour you out a blessing, I invite you to test him this morning while we stand and while we sing.